Woof, woof. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the regular meeting of council to order. Our clerk today will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Uh, I would ask for a procedural motion to proceed in camera. Move Councillor Thorpe, seconded Councillor Perino. All those in favor, any opposed? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 5th regular meeting of council. I'd like to first recognize that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Sinemic First Nation. Our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Tonight's regular meeting of council will be held in accordance with the Community Charter and Council Procedure Bylaw 2018, number 7272. Question period sign-up sheet is on the table by the double doors to my left for agenda items only. If during the uh, meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, would you please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet? And I can happily say all of members of council are here in person tonight and not having to join us electronically. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items. And Ms. Gurry, we do have one. Yes, Your Worship, thank you. For late items this evening, agenda item 15A, under other business, we're adding Sierra Club BC request for letter of support, re-advocacy for provincial action for biodiversity. And that's it, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Motion for the adoption of the agenda is amended. Moved Councillor Hemmins, seconded Councillor Prino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion for adoption of the minutes is circulated. Moved Councillor Armstrong, seconded Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? 
Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Mayor's report, I have three items tonight. Always happy to announce this for the athletically inclined in our community. Uh, pleased to welcome the Go By Bike Week event back to Nanaimo for the winter season. Register uh, and enter win to win prizes, attend events, reduce emiss emissions, and save fuel uh, from February 5th to 9th. Uh, celebration stations will be set up at various locations hosted by many gracious sponsors during the week. So plan your bike routes accordingly so you can stop in and say hello and enter to win prizes. Um, February the 5th, 7 to 9 is Metro Drive at Most Star Road. February 6th, 4 to 6, Front Street across from the Port Theatre. February 7th, 4 to 6 p.m., 1925 Boxwood Road at the north end of the roundabout. And February the 8th, 7 to 9 a.m., E&N at Giggleswick Place across from Brooks Landing. Uh, so to register online, uh, please, you can sign up for free at www.gobybikeweekbc.ca. And I'm delighted to uh, acknowledge the artists and designers for the 2024-2026 Urban Design Roster term. Uh, the new Ross roster of artists has been chosen for civic urban design. Uh, we have 21 new and returning artists and designers from across British Columbia to the urban design roster. Uh, art and artists and designers appointed to the urban design roster were chosen based on the strength and creativity of their past art and or design work, connection and relevance to the place and community, and evidence of their ability to meet the neat current and ongoing uh, civic needs uh, of our city. I'm not going to read out all 21 names, but I want to offer congratulations to them and the work that they will do for our city in the foreseeable future. And finally, I, I want to uh, repeat what was happily announced last week, that the city of Nanaimo was selected uh, by the uh, province, the Ministry of Housing, uh, to uh, receive the provincial program Homeless Encampment Action Response Teams in Temporary Housing, known as the Heart and Hearth Program. Um, the province and the city signed a memorandum of understanding on uh, January the 29th that formalizes our shared commitment to implement better homelessness response actions. Uh, I'm happy to announce that the 100 beds uh, will include 50 modular temporary prefabricated housing units uh, at 1300 Highland Highway, a site that's been leased by BC Housing. Uh, and uh, rather than shutting because it's not ready for construction yet, uh, the site at 250 Terminal uh, Avenue will be continued to be operated with 50 uh, uh, supportive and uh, housing beds as well. That is very good news for a city that has faced significant challenges as a result uh, of our ongoing homelessness issues that plague every community of any size in this province and indeed across the country. Uh, that's it for my report. Uh, we have a rise in report uh, from the in-camera council meeting December the 18th. Ms. Gurry, uh, do I have to read it all out? No. No, Your Worship, and you already covered um, A as well, and um, B, you can um, just advise on the 2024 temporary public art recommendations as well as the item C as well. Uh, very good. Um, and that was the appointment of our Youth Poet Laureate. Uh, we have no presentations. Uh, committee minutes are just for receipt, no motions required. A motion for adoption of the consent items, and we do have an exception as noted in the agenda that'll be considered separately. Moved Councillor Perino, seconded Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. And the separately considered item is your, the. Your Worship? Councillor Manley. I'm going to recuse myself yes. as the executive director of the Unitarian Shelter. Thank you very much. We'll give you a moment to vacate. Indian conflict. What? So, Councillor Manley's left the room. We can now consider the... Um, a separately addressed item, which is an AVICC resolution respecting emergency shelters in compliance with BC Building Code and BC Fire Code. I'll move. Moved, Councillor Hemmons. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Someone wants to tell Councillor Manley he can return now. Oh. 
And the next item are delegations unrelated to agenda items. And we have Brian Snyder, re bylaw update and compensation for homeowners upon closure of a manufactured home park in the city. Mr. Snyder, good evening. You could just state your name for the record. Good evening. It's uh, councillors, Mr. Mayor, Brian Snyder. I live in Charmin Mobile Home Park, 6325 Metro Drive. You'll have five minutes, and I will let you know when you've got a minute left. Please, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, thank you. My presentation is based on information from the Nanaimo Reimagined Housing Plan. Based on your vision, manufactured home parks represent an appropriate and an affordable housing option. But are they safe and are they stable? Let's explore this premise. During my presentation, I will ask some questions of the councillors. Most are rhetorical, but some would appreciate a response. I hope you will respond. So will parks be closed in Nanaimo? You may remember this slide from my presentation on November 1st, 2021. There are many reasons why this is highly likely. Parks are aging over 50 years old, only 10 to 12 persons per acre. They're all situated on valuable serviced city land and they have aging infrastructures that need upgrades. For example, in my park, there is a permit uh, to, uh, now uh, into the city for $1.5 million to redo all of the underground utilities. So which parks are the most vulnerable in our city? There are eight parks in the south of the city, average age over 54 years, occupying 96 acres of service developable land, housing over 1,000 residents in 560 homes with an assessed value of $73 million. These are the most vulnerable parks for closure in the near future. However, the future has arrived. Southgate, which is a small park in the south of the city, 14 homes, seven RVs on 1.6 acres, seven acres, is zoned R12, but it listed at $3 million, designated as a secondary urban center, and advertises a great potential investment with future rede redevelopment potential. So what will happen to the Southgate homeowners? Rezoning and permitting can take a long time. However, the moment there is public information about the redevelopment, all home values are zero. Raise your hand if you would buy a home in a park advertised for redevelopment. Homeowners are waiting in limbo for an eviction notice. Homeowner permitting land order. Upon permitting, the land order can give a 12 month notice to vacate. Homeowner can receive $20,000 to move their home. The developer is not required to pay that until the day they vacate and the maximum compensation they can ask for is home assessed value. Would you consider assessed value fair compensation for your home? So to receive this assessed value, however, under the legislation, within 15 days of receiving a notice of the eviction, the homeowner must start an RTV dispute. If they go six days, they've obviously lost. And they have to prove their home cannot be moved and there's nowhere to move it to in their community. The homeowner has no access to their home equity to search for another home. How much is that equity worth? For the 14 homes in the, in the Southgate, the current assessed value is 1.486 million. Legislation says they'll get 280,000 for an equity loss of over 80%, $1.2 million. Please raise your hand if you think this is fair. So what am I asking the council to do? Revise and update bylaw 2704. It's 40 years old. Things have changed. And apply it to all 21 manufactured home parks instead of just seven. Provide homeowners with a fair, reasonable, and equitable compensation upon the park closure. Why do I ask you to do this? In 2008, the council here wrote to the housing minister requesting the update legislation on homeowner compensation on park closure. You were supportive. The government took 10 years. One minute. Got a couple of things to do, thank you. To update legislation that still do does not protect the rights and equity of manufactured home park owners. Secondly, you said you would do it. In the Nanaimo reimagined C3215, you said you would require a tenant relocation plan. Are there any numbers attached to this plan? Here's some suggestions for you. 
The city takes responsibility to protect all manufactured homeowners on park closure, develop a fair and complete responsible, excuse me, <coughs> compensation plan, not based on uh, for six, a significant percentage above assessed value, perhaps appraised or market value. Make the developer responsible for homeowner moving costs. If you ever moved home, you know it costs a lot. And require the homeowner to pay out, or the, the require the landowner to pay out on issuance of a permit. And give the homeowners 24 months to vacate the property instead of 12. So my last question is for the councillors. Protect the dignity, safety, and lifestyles of manufactured home park owners with fair, adequate compensation before they lose their homes, as stated in your own housing plan. Thank you for the privilege to speak with you today. And I leave you with a quote, recent quote from our mayor. We can only fix it if we work together. Thank you very much, to answer any questions. Mr. Snyder. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you again, Mr. Snyder, and for your advocacy for those living in the manufactured home parks as you've been doing for many years. My question is, would you happen to know if the majority of people that are living in those homes are seniors on fixed incomes? Uh, Southgate is not a seniors uh, park sp specified. Uh, but having been down there and talked to quite a few people, most of them are seniors. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, through you, uh, appreciate the, the presentation. Uh, and I'm curious, have you forwarded uh, your slides to council? Uh, thank your pardon? Your slides? Yes. Have you forwarded them to council already? Yes, I did last Wednesday. Okay. Great, yes. thank you. I remember the mayor telling me two years ago that councillors always read their stuff. Yeah. I am ever the optimist. <laughs> Councillor Perino. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. I, I enjoyed this tonight, and, and I'm glad to hear that we'll get these particular slides, but I have been reading your emails, so I appreciate that. I just wonder whether or not, have you had any uh, feedback from our MLA or MP? Regarding. Uh, I've, uh, my MLA is Adam Walker up in Parksville. Yes. I have had several conversations with Mr. Walker. Uh, of course, he's left caucus now uh, and doesn't have quite as much influence as he had in the past. Uh, however, he is very interested in this topic and uh, does try and promote it as much as possible. Well, because he's out, he actually might be in a better position. So that's uh, just that, a thought. That's what right? I said to him, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because he can, he's independent. So, yes, and, uh, and the MLA in this area, have you talked to uh, No, I've re emailed uh, her a couple of times okay. and got no response. And I gather she's under a lot of stress anyway, so. Okay, might be worthwhile to do that as well. But I, Keep I trying, appreciate yes. this. It's good. Yeah, yeah. It's very I think good. the uh, people in Southgate have tried to contact her as okay. well. But the last I heard, they still hadn't received a response either. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. That's great. Thank if I could just add, sorry. Go, go ahead. One, one. Sorry, go ahead. Councillor Hammonds has a question for you, but go ahead if you wanted to say something. Uh, if you look at the South Gate, it is a park that, and, and this may bother a few people who live there, but it probably should be redeveloped. It's not in good shape, it's 50 years old. It has not been well maintained. The uh, park owner lives in Vancouver. Uh, the residents tell me that they never see the gentleman and uh, they try and contact him to do something about the park and they don't get any answers. Uh, so it's not well maintained. It doesn't generate a lot of revenue, maybe $100,000 gross a year. They have to pay taxes, which are about $9,000 insurance and, and if he does spend any more money on it. So if any developer looking at it and buying something for $3 million with a 75,000 gross income per year, no, you're going to redevelop it. And I, and I understand that. But we need to look after those people that are there. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Mr. Snyder, for coming here tonight and for the dialogue and all of the advocacy and emails we've received. Um, You've several times to me mentioned Langley Council's policy on this. Can you just highlight for me the pieces in that policy that you think are really pertinent? Uh, I think the, the key thing is, one, they recognize that the existing legislation does not provide a fair opportunity for homeowners when the park is going to be closed. Uh, also, and I don't know if I mentioned it strongly, there is that loophole in the, in the uh, legislation that allows the owner to say I'm closing the park, does not ask for a rezoning, does not give a reason, does not ask for any development permit. 
At that point, the maximum compensation he's responsible for is the $20,000. 12 months, you've got to leave the park, take your home, or leave your home. So the Langley Township recognizes that, sorry to answer your question. Uh, and they say that compensation is cl must be closer to market value, first of all. Do we know all. how much closer to? But what? Well, this is, a, yeah, that's a hard one. I've tried to do some re research myself, and uh, obviously brighter minds than mine need to work on that. But at any rate, assessed value typically is behind market value. Uh, not always, but typically it is. So that needs to be considered. And secondly, they did talk about Okay, if you're, the, if you're an old housing owner, I own housing, you have some responsibility to the people you're housing. Uh, so you should look after them, and there is significant cost in moving, finding a place to live. Uh, I know, talked to one person in that uh, park, and they basically said, if this happens to me, I'm on the street. Mm -hmm. Now, you're trying to get rid of homeless people. <laughs> Let's not make more, please. Thank you, I have a question for staff after. Thank you. Thank you very much. I much appreciate the advocacy, Mr. Snyder. Am I done? You're done. Thank you. Thank you. Well Councillor Hamilton, no, no, no. Please, please. I, 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 have, I have been through this before. We, we don't show approval or disapproval. It's a council meeting, please. Thank you. Oh, Councillor yeah. Hemmons. I, I appreciate that the rules of conduct you may find troublesome from time to time, but it enables people who sometimes have some reluctance to speak or be heard in a council chamber to be heard in a safe environment, and I expect all of you to comply with that, so please. No more, no more. I, if you are anxious to continue at a certain point, I would be hesitant to have to do it, and I would be extremely disappointed to have to do it, but I will clear the chamber if necessary. So please, try and restrain your emotions tonight, which are running high, I understand that, but this is a council meeting and a council agenda, and we have an agenda. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. My question uh, is uh, regarding Southgate Mobile Home Park um, and a response that we received from staff about its potential sale. So staff note, if the city were to receive a rezoning application, there are tenant protections that we could choose to apply over and above the provincial mobile home park tenant protections, and that these could be conditions of the rezoning application. Could I have some more information on what protections we could put in place over and above the provincial regulations, please? Sure, uh, uh, through your worship uh, to Councillor Hammond's question. So yeah, in the event that um, a mobile home park is rezoned, then council, um, there's a discretionary decision of council requested with respect to the land use uh, and similar to uh, policy referenced in uh, uh, Langley's case or we've uh, looked at policies in other communities, uh, Maple Ridge for instance, and as, as reference to the city of Nanaimo has on its, um, on its uh, books to develop uh, a tenant relocation policy as well. But um, in the case of rezoning, we can look at uh, additional requirements beyond the Provincial Manufactured Home Park Act requirements. And, and that would be, could include things like a tenant uh, notification plan, so um, outlining the, um, uh, the information that's required to be provided to tenants uh, and um, uh, the process and steps and timing of, of that, um, as well as uh, tenant relocation assistance plans. Uh, so these would be developed through uh, the development of, in, in more detail through the development of a policy. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, so could include um, uh, compensation, uh, uh, rent for term or funds in addition to the provincial requirement related to moving uh, expenses, um, that type of thing. So it'd be something that we could explore with council through, uh, through the development of a policy, which um, in the case that somebody were looking to rezone a, a mobile home park, uh, we could uh, explore uh, the conditions at, at, at that time. But Thank you. Pardon me, thank you for that. Um, so that's specific to this one potential property. When do we anticipate having the policy that would apply to all? And would the tenant relocation policy that we're working on include mobile home parks? Uh, yes, uh, it would apply. Um, it could apply to um, any, um, typically uh, the, uh, it's rezoning that triggers uh, the consideration of uh, a tenant, the city's ability to consider 
uh, addressing tenant relocation impacts. Um, as far as timing of the policy, um, and yes, it would apply to more broadly to, or could apply to mobile home parks more broadly, uh, potentially to other other properties as well, um, apartments that are being rezoned for uh, additional uh, housing, that type of thing. Um, other communities have similar policies in place. As far as the timing of the policy, uh, it may be a stretch to bring it forward this year, given the, the number of other um, uh, Items that uh, that were uh, the staff are dealing with related to provincial uh, housing uh, legislative initiatives, um, and some of those actually impact uh, potentially the ability to to address uh, uh, relocation impacts um, uh, beyond uh, because they made uh, um, the the uh, provincial legislative requirements adopting those may have uh, impacts on on whether or not the city will actually be rezoning. Uh, property, which is is the point in time where uh, the discretionary approval would would come into play with the relocation policy. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Uh, thank you. Are we limited as to the amount of money we can uh, request? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Armstrong's question, I think that would be one that we would have to think about carefully. I think there has to be a reasonable to that um, we'd probably look for uh, legal advice on that at the time we we're developing a policy so we couldn't look for that they must pay the assessed value at the time at the last BC assessment so I, that it's fair it's something that we'd have to look into okay. thank you thank you very much not seeing other further questions for staff we're on to reports the first is 12a property management strategy mr. Corson please Great, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, so what I wanted to do tonight was just give you a bit of an overview of the city's property management strategy. This is a document that uh, we last updated in 2013. And uh, what we wanted to do with all the good work that was happening with uh, city plan, integrated action plans, we wanted to take that work and make sure things were aligned. So the, uh, the strategy itself gives people an inventory of our land assets. It outlines uh, the various tools we use to acquire and dispose of land. It talks about some of our priorities, uh, properties that we could consider disposing of. It talks about how we do property management in terms of leasing and licensing of city land. And then it talks about how we do implementation and how we monitor our progress on the strategy. The, uh, so this, this strategy, again, we started off with the 2013 strategy. And uh, we had a look at our assets again to see, uh, to confirm uh, that our lands, uh, our inventory was accurate, and then we identified different opportunities going through city plan and other council's priorities, such as the strategic framework. And then we had a staff workshop where we uh, again went over priorities, confirmed we were all on the same page. We then developed a draft strategy. We uh, got some feedback on that, and now we have the final strategy in front of you tonight. So in terms of how much land does the city own, we own uh, just 3,773 acres, and that's a 11.5% increase over the last decade. So using the old strategy, we were able to acquire a lot of land, and I can, um, a lot of that was related to parkland acquisitions that we did around Lindley Valley, uh, the Rotary Bowl, uh, 933 Park, and uh, some of the downtown initiatives we did as well as a property we bought on East Wellington Road for the Loaves and Fishes Food Bank. In terms of our um, land, land holdings, two thirds of our lands are actually within the city of Nanaimo, and um, a third are actually outside the city, which are largely related to our, our water system. Um, so outside the city, of those lands, there's 12, over 12,000, uh, 12, <laughs> 1,200 acres which includes the Jump Lake Dam, the District Lot 9, which is on the backside of Mount Benson, uh, 350 Nama River Road, which is next to the, the uh, gravel pit, the Hub City gravel pit, and then Plekas Road, we have 100 acres, and then uh, the other two are all related to the water system. 
within the city, most of our land is actually parkland. So of the 2,518 acres, about 93% is parkland. The rest of the land largely in the city is, is allocated for existing um, functions. We do have some vacant land, um, but no, most notably would be uh, Port Drive, the Gene Burns property, and some of other development sites in the downtown core. We've, uh, in the strategy, we have a map just so people can, can see where our land holdings are. And uh, we've categorized it by different, by different uses. In terms of uh, property acquisitions, we uh, have a list of short-term, medium-term, and long-term acquisitions. And then um, how we prioritize those are based on whether or not we have funding for the project, if it aligns with city plan, what happens if we don't buy the property, is the uh, price uh, value and is the owner actually willing to sell. So those are kind of some of the criteria we use to bring acquisitions to council. And in terms of dispositions, um, we look at properties, we look at all our lands that might not be used to their highest and best use. Uh, we see if we have plans, will we actually get value in return for them? Is it uh, a straightforward process in disposing of the land or is a whole lot of prep work that needs to take place? Again, does it align with city plan? How will that ha affect our tax revenue? Will it help reduce taxes? And then uh, does it actually help advance? Moving the clock forward is about, does it actually advance other city goals? Uh, one of the things we have in the city is a lot of right of ways So a lot of our utilities, pipes, et cetera, are protected on private property through what are called uh, statutory right-of-ways. And uh, we have a, one of our staff members spends uh, considerable effort uh, making sure those are protected and negotiating with property owners. And, uh, and whenever we do new subdivisions, we ensure that our infrastructure, um, the city has access to it and can replace it. Uh, another area we spend quite a bit of time on is lease leasing and licensing of land. And this includes various uh, lease agreements with um, our client departments, so public works, parks and rec, and um, uh, various other groups. We also have license agreements with many community groups in the city, very common in the parks and rec field, and, um, and with other uh, government agencies. And in terms of implementation, the goal is to uh, have another look at this plan uh, as we update city plan, but really has about a 10 year horizon. And the idea is we come to council each year with an update for you to let you know which properties we've acquired and which properties uh, we've disposed of, just to keep you in the loop. And we adjust the strategy as we go forward. I think that's all I have for you this evening, Your Worship, on that topic. Thank you very much, Mr. Corson, much appreciated. Councilor Armstrong. Um, thank you, I was looking at your criteria for purchase and one concern I have, and we see it where we go out and purchase lands and then two years later we come and say we now need staff for this. Could you actually look at putting that as a criteria? Will an uh, uh, increase in staff or an increase in personnel be required? Thanks, Your Worship. So Councillor Armstrong, I think is referring to quite often when we buy park land. We know that if we buy a piece of land for park, we know there's additional maintenance required for it. And, uh, and are those cost factors actually put into that equation? So that's certainly something we can include in future staff reports as, as we bring those opportunities to Yeah, for me, it's important to have a cost benefit analysis because it's great to say we're gonna purchase, you know, $3 million worth of land. And then a year later, we now need four more staff people. So, which adds to the overall cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. No further questions for Mr. Corson. Much appreciated. Um, here are the next item as well, which is 12B, 2020 Halliburton Street, acceptance of project under revitalization tax exemption bylaw 2018 number 7261. Please. Great, thanks Your Worship. So we've been approached by the owner of 2020 Halliburton Street. They're doing a fourplex development um, at that location and they're interested in being accepted into the tax exemption program. The tax exemption program is uh, for a defined area of the downtown core and uh, this project meets the criteria of that. We did have a session with council in November where there was discussion of, of amending the program and changing some of the criteria. Uh, this, this application is consistent with the current program. Um, it would not be consistent with the future bylaw that will come to council at a later date. So staff certainly recommend um, this meets all the criteria of the current program and we're looking for council's uh, approval to accept this, this project. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Any questions? Someone care to make the recommended move, recommended motion, seconded by Councillor Brown. Any discussion on this one? Not seeing any, all those in favor? Contrary? Councillors Armstrong, Gesselbrock, uh, Brown and Manley, the motion carries, thank you. On to item C, uh, it's a liquor license application number LA155-7724 Stewart Avenue. Mr. Holm, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Your Worship. This is uh, an item that will be familiar to Council. It's actually returning uh, for Council consideration following uh, notice that was required. Uh, this is uh, the um, uh, conversion of a, a, a patio uh, for Carlos O'Brien's uh, neighborhood pub, uh, pub on Stewart Avenue that was um, an outdoor patio that was approved under a temporary program through COVID. Um, the, um, the owner has, uh, has put forward a request to to make the uh, the outdoor patio extension permanent, um, there's been a notification uh, that's that's taken place. Uh, Thirteen responses were received, eleven in favor, uh, two opposed. Those are attached to the council report. Uh, the RCMP have indicated they have no concerns with the proposed uh, permanent uh, patio extension, um, and staff recommend uh, um, supporting the uh, the extension. Happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Not seeing any questions. I'll put the motion on the table, Your Worship. Motion on the floor, moved by Councillor Greeno, seconded by Councillor Brown. Any discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor? And any contrary, none, motion carries, thank you. 12D, development permit application number DP1281-404 and 406 Millstone Avenue. Again, Mr. Holm, please. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a um, development permit. It's actually for three uh, separate parcels, but under uh, one development permit, um, what's proposed is uh, four units on each parcel, so three fourplexes. Uh, the zoning for these uh, properties are R, is R8. Um, there's a contemporary design uh, proposed uh, three-story buildings. Um, so 12 units in total on three separate parcels. Uh, a number of variances proposed, uh, minor variances in nature. Uh, related to um, uh, trellises, uh, trellis height, yard setbacks, and uh, parking uh, variances uh, for two of the lots from uh, six required uh, stalls to five proposed for lots one and three, and uh, reduction in or an increase, I guess, in the number of um, small car spaces permitted from 40% uh, to 80%. Um, this is in the town site neighborhood. It's a good uh, uh, infill project and uh, provides uh, housing in. Uh, proximity to services and school and employment. So um, being compliant with the development permit guidelines that are applicable as well. And happy to take any questions, thanks. Thank you very much. Moved by Councillor Himmons, seconded Councillor Perino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None, motion carried. You're opposed, sorry, Councillor Armstrong, forgive me. Uh, the next is E, Development Permit Application Number DP1306 uh, and 3201 Ross Road. Again, Mr. Holm, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a uh, development permit uh, for an accessory parking structure. Uh, this is uh, Low Hammond Row uh, Architecture on behalf of uh, Berwick Investments Limited, uh, proposing a um, multi-story uh, parking structure. A variance is proposed to uh, setbacks and uh, landscape buffer. Now this is additional parking to an existing um, uh, seniors uh, facility on the on the property. Uh, the, um, the proposal would uh, increase uh, the, the parking uh, provided from 48 spaces to 109 spaces. Um, the applicant identified that there's increased demand from uh, uh, residents as well as uh, visitors and also um, uh, this is proposed to address uh, off-site impacts of, of parking. Um, uh, happy to take any questions on this one. And uh, this is within the Long Lake neighborhood. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Not seeing any questions. Motions moved by Councillor Hemmins, seconded by Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next is F, rezoning application number RA497-6450 Island Highway North. Mr. Holm again. 
to the star of the evening. Great, uh, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, this is a rezoning at um, of an existing uh, mini storage uh, that uh, is currently zoned um, CC4, so Woodgrove Urban Center zoning. It's within the uh, Woodgrove Urban uh, Center under the, the city plan, the, OC, the official community plan. So existing mini storage, they're wanting to um, uh, add a uh, conceptually a multi-story mixed use uh, additional mini storage with uh, office building uh, to the property. Um, the property is adjacent to, you can see on the, on the outlined in red overhead, it's adjacent to uh, Green Thumb and uh, near uh, the um, uh, Enterprise uh, Island Highway uh, intersection. And uh, what's uh, proposed as conditions of approval are a community amenity contribution, uh, road dedication, uh, security of off-site works and services, and as well uh, um, amendments to a covenant requiring a sewer connection concurrent with uh, adjacent development. Um, the uh, potential public hearing date would, uh, for this application would be uh, March um, at this point if Council were to support the bylaws at uh, first and second reading. And I'm happy to take questions, thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Thorpe. No, it's a holdover, thank you. It's a holdover, sorry. All right, Councillor Eastmere, please. Okay, Councillor Armstrong, can you read the motion, recommended oh, motion? Yeah, sure, hang on. Uh, recommendation zoning amendment bylaw 2024 number 4500 decimal 220 to zone 6450 Island Highway North from Woodgrove Urban Center CC4 to Woodgrove Urban Center CC4 with a site specific mini storage use past first reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmins. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Councillor Armstrong. Zoning amendment bylaw 2024 number 4500 decimal 220 past second reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed, none? Motion carries. Councilor Armstrong, please. Council directs staff to hold a public hearing for zoning amendment bylaw 2024, number 4500, decimal 220, and council directs staff to secure the conditions related to zoning amendment bylaw 2024, number 4500, decimal 220, as outlined in the conditions of rezoning section of the report titled Rezoning Application Number RA4976450, Island Highway North, Dated 2024, February 5th, should council support the bylaw at third reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmins. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is G, General Amendments to City of Nanaimo Zoning Bylaw. Mr. Holm, again, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a, um, a set of general amendments to the zoning bylaw. Um, generally, uh, would uh, try to bring forward amendments uh, annually. Um, best case annually to improve uh, uh, clarity of the bylaw, uh, consistency, and to update the bylaw to address um, things like park acquisition, so rezoning property acquired um, for park, uh, for park purposes, um, those types of amendments uh, uh, as proposed uh, in this, in this uh, general amendment bylaw are 52 text amendments and 25 mapping amendments. Uh, they're included in attachment A to the report. Uh, the notice, um, required notice of uh, bylaw, proposed bylaw amendment has been given um, in advance of uh, consideration of tonight's, um, of the bylaw at tonight's meeting, and I'm happy to take questions, thanks. Very good. Not seeing any questions. Councillor Armstrong, please. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2023 number 4500 decimal 219 general text and mapping amendments to city of Nanaimo zoning bylaw 2011 number 4500 pass first reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Councillor Armstrong, please. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2023 number 4500 decimal 219 pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Perino. Any discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed, none, motion carries. A motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2023, number 4500, decimal 219, pass third reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe, all those in favor? Any opposed, none, motion carries. On to H, the 2023-2027 financial plan bylaw amendment. Ms. Mercer, please. Thank you, Worship. I'm gonna quickly pass this over to Ms. Fuller to introduce the report. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. On May 8th, Council adopted the 2023 to 2027 financial plan. Tonight's bylaw amendment reflects changes that have occurred since the adoption of the plan. Uh, the report details changes that either increased or decreased the expenditure budget or changed a funding source. And Appendix B details budget transfers between capital and operating funds. So it's really just a housekeeping to make sure our bylaw reflects everything that we did during the 2023 year. Thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Fuller? <coughs> Councillor Armstrong, please. Motion that financial plan amendment bylaw 2024 number 7359 decimal 02 to amend the 2023 to 2027 financial plan pass first reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion that financial plan amendment bylaw 2024 number 7359 decimal 02 pass second reading. Second, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion that financial plan amendment bylaw 2024 number 7359 decimal 02 pass third reading. Second, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Um, I realized, in fairness, Councillor Brown, you should be doing these tonight. I, 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 I noticed you didn't object in any way, and I caught poor Councillor Eastmere off guard. Councillor Armstrong just stepped in so willingly. It's, it's very, you're also very gracious and polite, but we'll let you do 13, which are the bylaws, please. Uh, your, your Worship, uh, I would move. Uh, the zoning amendment bylaw 2023 number 4500.214 to rezone 6124 Metro Drive from single dwelling residential R1 to residential corridor core one be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Perino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. We have no notices of motion. Under other business, we have the Sierra Club request for letter of support re advocacy for provincial action for biodiversity. Anyone care to speak to it or say anything about it? <coughs> Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor, through you. Uh, yeah, this request came in from Sierra Club uh, for a letter to be sent to the province. Basically, uh, there's a lot of requests from the community around uh, preserving certain pieces of land um, for biodiversity and park use. And there's uh, limits to what uh, we can afford as a city. And because of you know provincial legislation and the need for protection, um, we need to find alternate sources of funding for these. And so, the request is uh, for the city to write a letter um, requesting uh, support for the establishment of a local natural areas protection fund, um, an enactment of the provincial uh, law for biodiversity and ecosystem health, um, which is consistent with. Uh, resolutions that have been supported at UBCM and so there's a push to get these uh, pots of funding uh, provincial pots of funding to help municipalities with uh, property acquisition for supporting biodiversity and parkland so uh, the letter uh, set a recommendation around sending this letter uh, there's three recommendations um, just around uh, wording but centered around uh, the request for um, the province to, to create these these funds um, and so yeah I'd like to just move uh, that uh, council um, yeah follow the recommendation that the requested recommendation um, in the uh, correspondence that was sent by the Sierra Club I, I take it what you're really saying you that I write a letter to the Premier and the Minister of the Environment. Exactly. I mean, I, I could read it out just for Thank expedience's you. sake. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't, but uh, if you'd like me to, I could. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I'm glad you pointed out that it does uh, represent uh, confirmation of resolutions passed by the entire BC Union of BC Municipalities. I have a seconder, Se Councillor Manley. Any need for discussion? If not, all those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Question period, Ms. Gurry. Do we have anything? Thank 
thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, Dan Hula on the AAP, which was not a subject of uh, council agenda tonight, and the question period is for agenda items only, and I'm not going to uh, encourage people to not uh, adhere to the rules that govern our meeting. So the next one is uh, Mr. Annesley, and it's on 2020 Halliburton. Mr. Annesley. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the project at 2020 Halliburton, I'm just wondering if you guys could uh, explain more uh, the tax exempt status that they received as well as uh, I know the Marriott receives that as well. If you could just explain to the people here why those projects receive tax exempt status. Thank you. Mr. Lindsay, please. Uh, a number of years ago, probably six or eight years ago, council established the tax exemption program in the downtown. It was at a time when they were reviewing the development cost charge bylaw, and it was deemed that we needed to um, apply development cost charges in the downtown, something we'd historically not done. So the council of the day had a debate about, well, we still want to incentivize development in our downtown core, and the way the legislation allows for a council to do that is through a tax exemption program. So our tax exemption program gives uh, people who make, who hit the threshold and provide a significant investment in the downtown. If they hit that threshold, they're eligible for a tax exemption for up to 10 years for the municipal portion of the taxes. So there, as, as the speaker mentioned, the hotel was one example. That, that was actually under the hotel tax exemption program, which is citywide, um, but there's a separate program for the downtown. So there's other projects that have, resident, recent residential projects that have applied, and as a result, we've seen more development in the downtown. Thank you very much. And the next is Bill Manners, and it's 12H, the financial plan. Mr. Manners, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Bill Manners from the north end of Nanaimo. My question is relating to the 2023-2027 financial plan. And I'm looking particularly at Schedule A which has expenses, annual surplus, deficit, and then it has a line item, proceeds from municipal borrowing, negative 5,375,464. What does that mean? What is it? Ms. Fuller, please. Through the mayor to uh, Mr. Manners, uh, the borrowing was a short-term borrowing that we're doing for a property purchase. It's short-term borrowing, short-term borrowing for a property purchase. So, is that a paid-out item or a uh, item? So, it would be uh, money that we would borrow. So, it'd be funding coming into the city to fund a capital project. So, but that five borrowing, million being borrowed then? Yes, but the borrowing has not occurred. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Manners. Move Councillor Hemmons moves adjournment. Seconded. Councillor Thorpe, all those in favor? Any opposed? None?